I'm Smita Bagla, and I'll be emceeing this event. I want to start the program by acknowledging the presence, um, acknowledge our presence in the traditional ancestral land of the Tongva people. The la this land remains the unceded territory. And then I would like to recognize the hotel staff at Cerritos Sheraton, who are doing a great job of helping us through and do it. And I also would like to acknowledge our volunteers, Krista that you met who was, who's there, and Lakshman and Arun and Arjun. Arjun, in fact, is a movie producer, but he takes very good photos and videos. So if you want to make a movie, you can talk to him. I'll tell you why he's here then later. So I, um, I'm a technologist by my profession, a computer scientist. AI, I developed cancer research system in my life, sold a couple of technology companies, and then I started helping money, you know, investment, seed funds, and then Series A, Series B. Then I always loved acting, and this movie producer comes to me and says, can you help me raise money for my movie? I said, fine, I tried, I was successful, I even did an act in the film, and now the movie bug has hit me. So first, I want to know how many people, when they think of South Asian community, what do they think of? Yoga, or uh, Bollywood, or the cuisine of India? Bollywood, and the cuisine of India? Like what? what? And when you think of the cuisine of India, what's the first name that comes into your mind? Not naan, but what's the other first? Curry. Anybody else? Samosa, right? So the name of my movie that was in theaters last year in December was called Four Samosas. So, and the reason I bring it up, because I think we, we love doing everything in fours. We have the four presenters here. We are talking about the quad. We are talking about, you know, even samosas have four points, the bottom three points and the one on the top, right? So everything has four in it, right? So, and the other question is, how many people know what a quad is? Is it quadriceps? Fitness? Well, when I went to college, the quad was the area we went and hung out, right? But the quad here, and I think everybody here knows what the actual quad is. In May, the leaders of Australia, India, Japan, and United States convened and reaffirmed their steadfast commitment to work through the quad to support a free and open Indo-Pacific that is inclusive and resilient. In their joint vision statement, they said that their vision is for a region that's peaceful and prosperous, stable and secure, and respectful of sovereignty, free from intimidation and coercion, and where disputes are settled in accordance with the international law. So he, there, you have it. This is the new quad. This is where we all hang out now, right? Because we are beyond college. Anybody in college? No, okay. Well, you can go to your quad also, but you're welcome here. So thank you everyone for coming here. And, um, and if you want to see my movie, Four Samosas, it's available on, what, on the streaming platforms. I'm not going to do a pitch here, but that is what you like it. It's a quirky story. So I would like to thank the council generals and welcome them to hear the, the leaders, um, the commerce leaders, the diplomats who are here, as well as all the people who are who have made their drive to Cerritos and are here. So I would start with thanking the World Affairs Council for having this event and for Krista being an awesome person. She's the star of the show. And I would also like to thank our financial sponsors. So the Australian Consulate in Los Angeles, thank you for sponsoring this event, the Shah Happiness Foundation, I uh, think they are not here right now, but thank you, the Port of Los Angeles, thank you, the 
and I'd like to thank the media sponsors. That is the World Affairs Council of Orange County. So how many people are here because our World Affairs Council sent a mailing? We need to do better mailings. <laughs> Very good, but thank you for being here. And IIT alumni, Lakshman is the current president of Southern California IIT and Arun is the also, he's one of the directors of IIT alumni. How many people are here because IIT did the mailing? Well, we are here because we are IITians and we are because of our mailing, right? The Pacific Council of International Policy. Thank you. Nobody here from there? Asia Society, SoCal. Anjali was supposed to be here. They did a mailing for us. And then the Verde Exchange News, David. So how many are here because of David? Many. And I would also like to recognize the table sponsors. So um, this is State Bank of India, California, from Puja Sarothya. Thank you, table sponsors. Navneet Chuk and Chuk Firm. <laughs> Thomas Malyalil and his gang. Thank you. Vandana Tilak and Ravi Tilak over there, table six. Thank you. And then we also have Arush Muradian, the US Armenian Council for Human Rights. Thank you everyone for making it happen for us here. So I would like to call Marisela Carabayo de Ruggiorio, the Director of Development for the Port of Los Angeles. She's been in this position since 2019. She oversees the Trade Development Division, ensuring the port fulfill its mission to connect US businesses throughout America with overseas trade opportunities, particularly exports through trade promotion and workshops. Please join me to welcome her and would you like to speak for a couple of minutes? Sure. Thank, you. Thank you for that warm introduction. Um, once again, my name is Maricela Caraballo de Ruggiero. I'm Director of Trade Development at the Port of Los Angeles. I'm also joined today by our esteemed colleague, Chris Cannon. He's our Director of Environmental Management and our Chief Sustainability Officer. Many of the items that's gonna be discussed today um, one of the main ones that you've been hearing about is our green shipping corridors agreements that we've been signing with ports around the world. And Chris has been behind all those agreements on the green shipping corridor side and all of our environmental programs at the Port of Los Angeles. So I'm looking forward to the conversation by our Consul Generals and please enjoy your dinner. Thank you. Thank you, Maricela. Next, I would like to call David Abel, who is the founder and chairman of Verde Exchange. He um, hosts a conference that, uh, for the last 17 years annually, that is for global clean and green tech uh, marketplace to optimize opportunities for transformational climate infrastructure investments. I said it. It is also, he also presently serves on the executive and governing board of Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation, among others, government and city boards. Welcome, David. Thank you. you well, I'm honored to be here, and wherever, uh, whenever Gunjan asks me to go someplace, I go. So I'm honored to be here with you, and we, he asked me to say a few words, and I will. I have a speech, but I'm not going to pull that out of my pocket. And we have a platform for the last 17 years, a global platform that um, brings people in the marketplace, what's in market, about to be in market, and needed in market, and energy, water, transport, finance, and green build. And we couldn't do that conference over these years, couldn't attract the people we attract without being in concert with the values of the Quad. So secure trade under the rule of law and resiliency and addressing the challenges of our of our time. I'm delighted to be a part of this meeting and gathering and uh, most of the Council Generals here and their countries have been participants and we look forward to the Quad flourishing and we'll be perfectly fine if they do. So thank you, I'm delighted to be here and honored to be here. Thank you, David, really appreciate it. Um, now I would like to call Ronak Desai he is an incoming trustee of the Orange County World Affairs Council, 
and he currently leads the India practice and congressional investigations practice at Paul Hastings. And in addition to his law practice, Ronak also serves as an advisor on South Asia issues to the US Congress. He's a recognized expert in these arenas, serving as the frequent author and commentator on these issues. Please join me in welcoming him. And also, today is the Indian Festival of Janmashmi, and it is the birth of Lord, Lord Krishna, and David from World Affair Council promised to dance to us for the... <laughs> oh, Robert, 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 <laughs> I'm sorry. But Ranak is observing the fast, so I just wanted to be sure that he recognized it for that. Ranak, would you like to speak? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I promise you I'm not hangry, despite the way that I look. Um, but let me just add my own words of welcome to each and every one of you on behalf of the World Affairs Council of Orange County. Um, it is such a treat to have all of you convene together and be here for such a, an important event with such distinguished guests uh, on such an important topic. The council over the past you know, several years has really established itself as being one of the premier foreign policy institutions, not just in the region, but I'd say in the country. And when I moved to California or back to California from Washington, D.C., I was just absolutely stunned and thrilled when I discovered uh, the World Affairs Council and the, the reach it has and the impact it has and its ability to bring the countries and really the world's leading practitioners, policymakers, business leaders to this part of Southern California, right? Who would have thought it? And for that reason, the simple ask that I have just based on my own experience is if you're already a member, get more involved. If you're not a member yet, please join us. It has been such a fantastic experience, I think, for those of us who so deeply care about world issues and the various challenges that are confronting the community internationally at this time. And you know, one of the things that I've seen just in the past couple of years is the events that this council has been able to put on and the people that they've been able to bring, I think very much underscores the reality that Southern California is a gateway. It's a gateway to international business, to diplomacy, to culture. It's a place for the community to come together and to find other folks across the region who so deeply care about the issues uh, that we'll be discussing today. Um, and it's a gateway to the Indo-Pacific, right? And I, I know that's one topic that we're gonna be focused on uh, over dinner this evening. I think that actually is a good segue because it's my high privilege and, and pleasure to actually introduce our moderator in chief who's uh, Gunjan Bagala, who's sitting right here at table one. And Gunjan and I have had the, the opportunity to have gotten to know each other uh, over the past few months. He is a, a community leader, he's a thought leader, he's an author, uh, he's just a good guy, which, uh, you know, in, in this day and age, there just seems to be a dearth of all those things put together. He's also the organizing and driving force of tonight's event. Uh, he's the one that we've really partnered with to bring you know, to bring such a distinguished set of consuls general to, to Cerritos tonight. So, you know, I know Gunjan is going to take the stage soon along with the rest of our guests. Um, we're going to ask him a ton of questions. And with that, let me, you know, welcome him and welcome the rest of you. And, and please give me a round of applause as we get tonight started formally. So, uh, I'm sure when you got here, it felt like... Uh, it might be the Bombay train station. Uh, I wouldn't say Tokyo because the Tokyo train station is far more organized when it's crowded, okay? Uh, so there's always a little bit of chaos when brown people are involved in doing anything. And uh, we're running a little bit behind, as you might have noticed. The dessert's still coming out, I think, right? Yeah, okay, so I'm going to improvise, okay? Um, so when I was about seven years old, my dad got me a toy that I was quite impressed by. It was a hanging monorail. It was colored pink. So Consul General Kenko Sone, you can guess which country it came from, right? It was a Japanese toy, and I was fascinated by it. I played with it for four or five years, but you know, we Indians tried to save money, so that, was, that became my brother's favorite toy, okay? And... Uh, 
that's probably what led me to become a mechanical engineer. Um, uh, the, and I went to the Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur, uh, set up by Caltech and MIT. So the, uh, you know, we engineers always like numbers. So four countries getting together. Is that one plus one plus one is four? Okay, no. Don't, no, none of the engineers, I don't want you to answer this question. I believe it's factorial four. Now somebody who's not an engineer, can you tell me what factorial four is? What, what does it represent? Come on guys, how much? 24, right? Four times three times two times one. And we will see some examples of how this group has created that kind of multiplication. Um, also, just tell you a little bit about what I do. So just yesterday, there's a company in San Diego that was able to place a quarter million dollar order for two barrels of what is called heavy water. Okay? They, they were trying to do this on their own. They couldn't. They came to us. We helped people solve Indian problems, and we did. But I solved a much more difficult problem for my dear friend Thomas Malayal. He told me that he was having trouble finding Indian wine. Okay? So I said, you're not talking to the right person. Okay? And I think we have some Sula wine on his table. Okay? So uh, people come to us when they need to solve problems about India, whether it's wine or heavy water. Doesn't matter. <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. For those of you who don't know what heavy water is, it is, uh, it is used in nuclear power plants in India. India is the largest baker of it. I won't get into a lot of detail about that right now. Um, how long is it before we have the dessert? I can only go on for so long. <laughs> oh, she thinks I can go on forever. <laughs> ah. Okay, so I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking. Okay, okay. Ah. Alrighty. So um, on your tables, you will find index cards, and I think Krista has also placed some pens or pencils. Okay, we do everything backwards when I moderate. I want you to write down your questions on those cards, okay? Questions that con concern the interactions between Australia, Japan, the US, and India. For us brown people in the room, please don't ask Consul General Reddy about visa questions, okay? Or uh, OCI or anything, that's not relevant, okay? Um, the, uh, I, won't go, I won't enumerate all the things we shouldn't be asking, because I'll, questions will be written down. If you write your name, I might even mention it and ask you to read out your question. Uh, but uh, incendiary questions will be filtered out by the volunteer team. Okay, uh, We're looking for a dialogue. And I may even turn to a couple of members in the audience. Okay, They don't know who they are yet. Okay, So be on your toes. Don't try to go to your smartphone. I might thrust my mic in front of you. Okay, <laughs> um, Let's see. What else can I talk about? Um, 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 um. The quad? No, no. We have the experts on that. I'm just the moderator. I do want to acknowledge that there are many important people in the room. Okay? Uh, Smita mentioned some of them. I am afraid to start naming because then people who I don't name will get upset. So forgive me. I'm going to do it anyway. What the heck? Okay? So from the city of Los Angeles, okay, the largest city in Southern California, we have, where are you, Christine? Oh, right here, Christine Peterson from the Mayor's Office of International Affairs. Did I say that correctly? Okay, all right. Um, from the American Jewish Committee, they're great friends of everybody in town. We have uh, Alyssa Bernstein, whom I got to know a while ago, and Odin. I'm sorry, I forgot your last name, Odin. Hassan? Okay, wonderful. Okay, and uh, we already met Marisela uh, from the Port of Los Angeles. Um, you know that 40% of all the trade that happens in the United States comes through the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles. And much of it comes from Japan, some of it from Australia, 
even a little bit from India. So the port is an important part of the community. Has anybody visited the port as, besides taking a Catalina cruise? Has anybody visited the port on business? It's a city unto itself. What is it, 10,000 acres or more? Yeah, yeah, it's a huge, huge complex. I, I, Maricela gave us a tour once through an organization she and I belong to, and it was just amazing. Um, the various consul generals have their staff here as well. And uh, uh, from the Asia Society of Southern California, I have my dear, dear friend Anjali Sharan sitting right here. Okay. For three years, she's been the acting executive director. And I think you have to stop acting now. Okay. I talked to Tom McLean yesterday for the Asia Society. She's already done acting, you know. So uh, thank you for, for your support of this event. Um, and she's married to an IITN. Yes, you know. We are a close knit community. So. First of all, you know, like the Grateful Dead used to do, um, they would call people from the cheap seats to come sit up front. So those of you who don't have a good view in the back, there's four empty seats here, five. You, welcome to come on. I didn't ask the, the diplomats for permission, but what the heck, okay? Um, I'm going to wander about the room, uh, if that's okay with, with all of you. And uh, let's get started. I'm, we're done with thanking everybody and all of that. Now the real, Meet starts, okay. So, um, Consul General Sone, 2004 is when the Quad was conceived and it was created or conceived by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, if I remember right. So would you like to bring us forward to 2023 and what does the Quad mean today for the people in the room? Well, thank you. Uh, first, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for having this occasion. I'm very much honored to be here. Uh, Gunjan is always uh, very supportive uh, of our collaborations in various ways, and really thank you for organizing these uh, meetings. Well, uh, I think the, the Quad Dish just started in, you said, 2004. It's right after the, uh, the, uh, the earthquake in Indonesia. At that time, we have been uh, start thinking about what we in this region, the, uh, the collaboration uh, among those big countries is really important. But then, then during that time, the, the, the meeting was more like the official levels. And also, we have some different kind of configuration of the meeting, like, uh, but somehow it's always in Japan and the United States together, Japan, US, Australia. And we also start having the meeting with Japan, US, India. And then those kind of meetings has happened. And also, we also have the different configuration, Japan, US, South Korea, which we recently have very successful summit meeting in Camp David, but, uh, by the way. And uh, well, the, but the, I think the Prime Minister Abe uh, was always very much um, looking forward for the, this four countries' collaborations. He really put the uh, strong em importance of those co collaboration about the uh, four countries. Uh, but the, uh, you know, it's not so easy to bring those leaders together of the meetings. Uh, I think the, the, uh, one of the epoch-making uh, occasion, I think my personal view is that the, uh, while I was, uh, you know, I've been posted in India in 2016 and 19, and uh, at that time, in, I think it's 2016, Prime Minister uh, visited uh, Kenya having the uh, uh, leaders meeting with Japan and the uh, African leaders. We call it the TICAT, Tokyo International Conference for uh, African Development. Although it's called Tokyo, but we uh, have the, uh, the, the meeting in uh, Kenya. And then the Prime Minister announced the uh, idea of free and open Indo-Pacific, which is uh, very, uh, very, uh, almost first time Japan to create the, uh, the message to bring to the uh, international community. And that just uh, talking this uh, idea to various countries, and first the US is on board, and Australia and India is together. And then that I think the uh, US government is start thinking, maybe in order to promote those uh, free and Indo-Pacific, those four countries really are key uh, uh, collaborators working together to bring other countries uh, together. 
and to, to taking more initiative. That start having more higher level meetings, starting with the, uh, the, the foreign ministers meeting, then having the leaders meeting. The first meeting I think was in, in, in physical meeting was in, in Washington DC. And then a second meeting was uh, hosted by Japan in last year in, uh, in, in May. Uh, and then uh, it's supposed to have <laughs> another meeting in Australia, but somehow uh, it's happened to be in Japan, but this should be been the Australia always promoting that the third uh, leaders meeting, physical meetings. And then we are expecting the next uh, summit meeting in India, uh, I hope in next year. So it's a cycle of those uh, uh, the four leaders meeting every year. And we also uh, created more robust uh, the framework of uh, uh, various level of meetings and collaborations. I was really amazed that the last couple of years, just one or two years, we already created so many uh, layers of collaboration about, among four countries. That I really ap appreciate those the uh, staff of each four countries, uh, government officials working so hard to creating those, that co uh, good moment. But I think that the, the, uh, that, that the reason why we are so much working on together is that the, uh, the idea of the free and, Indo, free and open the Pacific is really, uh, really uh, important, uh, the vision that we share together so that uh, uh, four countries working together. Not only the vision, but we are really working hard for the actual uh, collaborations and projects and plans and uh, it's really happening so that the uh, I think that what is really important and very interesting uh, phenomena happening among uh, four countries. Thank you, Consul General. So um, please uh, start submitting your questions uh, and I'm going to request the, the esteemed diplomats to try and keep their answers as short as possible so we get more uh, questions from the audience. Um, we chose this date for a very specific reason, you know. Um, so as you might know, that uh, the G20 is meeting. Uh, so I wrote an email after we figured this out. I wrote an email to President Biden saying, why don't you travel to New Delhi? And then all the other G17 members agreed. So, uh, you know, we are going to be in the news tomorrow, I think, right? <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Okay, um, but the, G, the, the Quad members will all be there. Uh, President of Russia, or whatever he's called now, I forget, whatever title he has won't be there, and President Xi won't be there, but everybody else on the G20 is going to be there uh, tomorrow, I think it is when it starts. So uh, that's wonderful news. Now, um, the last meeting uh, was organized uh, by the Australian Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese. And uh, Consul General Duke, could you tell us a little bit about what was specifically agreed, uh, you know, in terms that the audience can understand? A lot of that diplomacy is kind of goes over our heads, you know. <laughs> so please help us figure that out. <laughs> I'll get more unorthodox later, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'll do my best. But thanks thank very you. much, Gunjan. You're someone that I've learned I can't say no to. So thank you for putting tonight's uh, event on. Um, it was a very significant meeting that took place in Japan in the meeting in the margins of the G7. Um, it was the third in person leaders level meeting. Uh, and it was the first time that they agreed on a shared vision for the region. And in that shared vision, they set out four key principles that will guide our actions uh, for the good of the region. And that's very clear in the communique that they issued. But the four key principles are ones we can all relate to on what we hope for our region, which is that it's prosperous and stable and economic growth. A second one, that there's respect for international law uh, and uh, the multi strengthening the multilateral system. The third, that there is respect for international regional institutions like ASEAN, like the Pacific Island Forum and like IORA, the Indian Ocean Rim Association. And fourth, that there is transparency in what we do. 
And, uh, and that was quite significant. It's a short statement um, that you can um, all have a look at. There's a, a, a glossy publication. We um, had a, a number of copies here to hand out in case um, people are interested and want to find out more about the Quad. But the other key uh, development um, was the joint statement that was issued by the leaders. Uh, and in that, you'll see a, a growing sense of strategic convergence. It's around... So what, what does strategic mean? Can you tell us, please? Well, in this context, I, I think it means that there's agreement on how we frame our approach to key issues. Uh, and it might be global and regional issues like the situation in um, the DPRK or in Ukraine, and that they're specifically referenced. But in the communique, there's also uh, very um, specific action items for agreement um, that we will do for the benefit of the region. So taking forward, for instance, the success of Quag countries in, um, in helping distribute over 400 million vaccines to the region, uh, there's an initiative around health security. So helping the region to um, develop um, better capability, detect and respond to epidemic and pandemics. Um, another um, specific um, uh, agreement that we would do is around uh, building capacity on infrastructure. So doing feasibility studies around undersea cable technology and that ability to Southeast Asia. Uh, an infrastructure fellowship program to assist infrastructure practitioners in the region learn the skills um, through uh, professional exchanges and through scholarships. So as you can see, a range of very specific activities that were agreed that we would do. Another one specifically for the Pacific actually was around um, improving telecommunications infrastructure through open radio access network capability with Palau. So as you can see, um, and there's, there's real uh, examples, real money behind this that will roll out for the future. Um, and, uh, and I think that that has really elevated uh, the Quad cooperation and quite rapidly too when you think that the first leaders meeting wasn't only, only a few years ago. You're seeing an elevation of over, you know, lots of different activities and initiatives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I'd like to ask uh, Secretary Dawson, I can't call you Camille, I'm sorry. <laughs> Secretary Dawson, uh, about how does the Quad fit into the overall US strategy. Um, you know, Quad kind of lingered in the backwaters for a while. Then our previous president, whom I will not name, uh, kind of brought it back to the forefront. And then President Biden has really amped it up. But the US has so many things going on. So can you tell us briefly, from your perspective, as being responsible for all of East Asia and and the Pacific, how, how, does, how does the Quad fit in, in in your daily way of thinking about the world? Sure, well first of all, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight. I got to escape the Washington DC heat <laughs> to be here, so. Um, when we think about the US strategy for the region, um, that is the Indo-Pacific strategy and it's something that uh, this administration released in February of 2022. And it lays out quite clearly our vision for the region. Uh, and there is one really defining feature of that strategy. And that is that there is a recognition that the challenges and opportunities in the Indo-Pacific region are so vast that no one country can address those alone. It is therefore absolutely necessary for the United States to work with a number of allies and partners um, to work together to achieve our vision for the region. And in order to do that, in our Indo-Pacific strategy, we lay out um, 
what we refer to as uh, the need for a lattice work of overlapping coalitions of partnerships. Uh, and I the, like that word, lattice work. It's a great yeah. word, right? Yeah. Um, and, and if you, you, know, you sort of visualize it in your mind, you think about these, you know, these different layers of partnerships that we have, some through existing established regional institutions like the ones that Jane referred to, ASEAN, the Pacific Islands Forum, Indian Ocean Region As Rim Association. Um, some are, are these newer, more flexible, minilateral organizations, as the Quad is out, often referred to as a minilateral. Um, so that is really where the Quad and the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy overlap um, or come together. It is one of many, um, but one of the most important, uh, partnerships that we have in the region through which we are working in a collective manner, bringing our resources together so that we can better address the very significant needs of the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Con Consul General Reddy is brand new to California. So I'll just ask you a quick question to get started. Um, you know, all the other countries actually border the Pacific. What's India doing in this group? You know, <laughs> we're, we're kind of, we're always the odd man out, right? So why, why, why are we in the quad? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, first of all, uh, it is a great pleasure for me to participate in the event. As uh, Mr. Gunjan Bagla mentioned, I'm only two weeks old in US, uh, I, I'm in San Francisco. So Gunjan contacted me while I was in Delhi and requested me to participate in the event, which I readily agreed. Thank you very much for providing this platform to interact with the distinguished gathering and also my colleagues on the dais. So uh, regarding India, uh, uh, for me, I see the growing cooperation in the positive areas especially which uh, uh, facilitates economic growth and also well-being and prosperity in the overall Indo-Pacific region. Just to give you an example, the efforts of the Quad countries with regarding to climate change, especially uh, support to the countries in the climate change mitigation, adaptation and resilience. For example, uh, Marcelia, uh, I think just now mentioned regarding the green shipping corridors like the Port of Los Angeles, Mumbai Port, we have a port in Sydney and also Japan, Yokohama. So there is a proposal to make them uh, all the shipping value chain to net zero. And also by 2030, there's a proposal to make at least two to three shipping corridors, low or close to net zero. Similarly, there is a cooperation which is of interest to India, especially the clean hydrogen cooperation, which India is also uh, means leading in the group, uh, where uh, uh, the countries are collaborating in the research and development to bring down the cost of, for example, say, the hydrogen electrolyzers and uh, other re renewable areas like the reduction in the cost of the solar photovoltaic cells and also uh, like uh, electric vehicle battery. And India is also interested in other positive areas like uh, in the supply chain, especially for the semiconductors and also especially with regarding to the disaster uh, resilience infrastructure we have a coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure based in new delhi uh, the quad is co collaborating with that and uh, doing some uh, work in the pacific island countries and other island countries in the indian ocean and also some of the areas where the quad is helping out is like the indo pacific maritime domain awareness where the quad countries are helping the, the smaller countries in the indo pacific region uh, with uh, for, to fight illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, and also with regarding to prevention in the like uh, environmental events, heavy pre precipitation kind of events, and also to manage the uh, co coastal and marine resources. So I think for me personally, we see a lot of not only the strategic th thing which already my colleagues from Australia and also US already explained, but we see a lot of things, especially like. Uh, 
the Australian colleague mentioned regarding health partnership, from vaccine partnership to health partnership. So these are the areas of collaboration which will not only help the Quad countries, including India, which is a developing country in the grouping, and also other countries, uh, developing countries in the broader Indo-Pacific region. So these, these are all, according to me, important for India. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you, each of you. Um, so question for the audience, again, none of the brown people answer this. Who's, who's the largest vaccine maker in the world? Which company, which company? Serum Institute. Serum, who said Serum? Okay, now who's the second largest maker of vaccines in the world? That's an advanced question. It's not J&J, &J, it's not Pfizer, it's not Moderna. It's not Bharat Biotech. Now the brown people can try too. Nobody knows? It's a company called Biological E in your favorite town of Hyderabad. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so let's turn our attention to Southern California. Most of us live here. I know a few of you have traveled from outside the region, but most of us live here. And here in Southern California, you know, we are one of the most global cities in the world. We have 60 consulates here. Okay, maybe we'll do an event one time with all 60 consulates on stage. Um, the largest investor from all over the world here in Southern California is who? Which country? Anybody name that? Japan, Japan, right? There's no difficult answer there. Even though Toyota left and even though Nissan left, still, <laughs> Japan rules. So, uh, Consul General Sone, tell us a little bit about what Japan is doing here in Southern California. One and a half minutes, please. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to be uh, short. I mean, this, the, of course, it's a uh, huge investor. It's been doing a lot of businesses. And then it's also I have a connection with the Japanese American communities as well. Uh, that really supporting the Japanese and Japan US relations a lot. Uh, this, the uh, Japanese American is really big. Uh, the, the portion of that, our collaborations. And then the investment is in the various fields in, 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 in manufacturing uh, technologies and in, in San Diego areas, maybe uh, the medical, uh, the bio related. Yeah. Yeah. And, but in here in Los Angeles and also some connection with the, the, the Quad collaboration is, is the port operations. I think that among the Quad agreement, uh, we've been uh, agreed to working together with the, uh, the decarbonization of the port operations among four countries. And uh, now Japan has been really collaboration with a Japanese port, like uh, uh, Nagoya is a, a close collaboration with the port of uh, uh, Los Angeles. And we'd like to expand our collaboration with the, uh, those ports in uh, uh, in India and Australia. So that it's a really important part. And one of the areas we've been really focusing on in the, the utilizing of the hydrogen. And the hydrogen technology is going to be a huge uh, benefit for this region for uh, tackling those climate issues. I would like to call up, well, we've been already start have collaboration with Australia and of course in the United States and we'd like to expand our collaboration with India as well. Yeah. And then maybe also the, the semiconductor industries. When I was posted in India, uh, India was always interesting dealing with the semiconductors. At that time, maybe you, India is not that ready, but you explain that the India is really moving ahead for the semiconductor industry so that the uh, resilient supply chain in those uh, key uh, industries and the uh, critical technologies is also another area. Japan would like to uh, be working in this region as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So some of you might be wondering, who are we free from and what, why do we want something open? Okay, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that, I promise you. Um, Secretary Dawson, would you like to add to why Southern California people should care? Not just the average Southern California as you propose, but all the smart people in this room. Why should they care about the Quad? Right, well, um, so, 
California obviously has a very strong connection to the region, to the Indo-Pacific region broadly. And, and when we talk about the Quad, it's important to recognize that what the Quad is about is not the four countries represented on this stage. It is the four countries represented on this stage coming together to bring benefit to the entire Indo-Pacific region. So the Quad is really about the region as a whole. Um, so Californians have a huge tie to the region through people-to-people -people connections because of large diaspora communities here in California, those extended ties, and huge economic ties. Um, the, I, I think the figure is $123 billion in exports from California to the Indo-Pacific region, close to 370,000 jobs created here in California because of those exports. Something like $6.5 billion a year coming to California through international students in the universities in the state. That number is not broken out by uh, specific to the Indo-Pacific region, but a very large percentage of the overall number of international students in the state hail from the Indo-Pacific region. So there are very clear economic reasons for Californians to care about the region. We know um, in the United States as a whole that our own prosperity and our security is tied directly to that of the Indo-Pacific region. So, you know, if nothing else, it's for your own selfish interest in staying secure and prosperous that you want to care about what is happening in the, re in the region. Thank you, thank you very much. So I'm going to turn to our questions or comments from the audience, starting with my friend David Abel, <laughs> who, who negotiated how much time he would get. I said two minutes, he said, how about one? <laughs> so you're, you're in very deeply involved in Southern California and with countries that are part of the Quad. Well, as I shared with, um, with Jane Duke, uh, California often thinks of itself as its own nation. Um, so maybe it ought to be five instead of four <laughs> on the stage. But um, we're definitely, same with the board and the other countries here, definitely interdependent with uh, Indo, is this region. And uh, I'm not sure we quite have the culture, the global diplomatic culture in Southern California to justify our economic presence, but the Quad and you all and what Gunjan's doing are, is gonna help promote our more active involvement in this region and in diplomatic affairs. But my one question is, how dependent is the Quad going forward with the on the current leadership of the four countries here today? Is a change of party in any one of those countries likely to undermine the progress that's been made to date? Thanks. I, you know, I have somebody else in the audience who's extremely knowledgeable about the Asia Pacific. All of us know about the RAND Corporation, right? The Research and Development Corporation. Although one of my friends who used to work there called it the Research and No Development <laughs> Corporation. Uh, they were responsible for conceiving the idea of, uh, of a space, you know, space mission. They, they conceived the idea of, what is it that Elon Musk is working on? Uh, the fast train, whatever it's called, what? Hyperloop. And many, many revolutionary things came out of RAND. Uh, my friend Rafiq Tosani runs the Center for the Asia Pacific at RAND, and I'd love to get your perspective on what RAND thinks about Southern California and the Asia Pacific. Thank you, Gunjan, that's very kind. Um, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to pose this question, or at least a comment. You know, I have actually two, two points I want to make, one relative to Southern California and one uh, more general. And the more general is more as an analyst. Um, you know, the court says that it is going to provide what we might call global public goods. You know, better vaccinations, 
higher standards of working, climate change support uh, control. So the, the general question is, uh, what is it about the court that makes it particularly qualified to do so? In the sense that you, you have the WHO, which is supposed to look after the health situation. You have a very powerful UN body called the UNFCCC, which looks after climate change issues. So where does the court fit in in that broader multilateral international framework of things? So that's the analyst question. As far as Southern California is concerned, um, I know David Abel mentioned the issue of uh, that we are kind of short on the diplomatic uh, uh, capacity. Uh, I, you know, I, my, my sense is there's plenty of interest. I mean, we have public diplomacy experts, you have diplomacy experts all over California, not just Southern Cal. And I was wondering that um, to what extent has the Quad thought about this issue of, of involving somewhat more broadly rather than diplomats that are seated in Washington, D.C.? Look at you know, public diplomacy, you, know, you have sister cities and so on. And I'm looking at Matt Asada from USC who works on these issues. So to what extent has the Quad thought about that and that's where California could play up? an important role. Thank you, Rafiq. Thank you. So, um, so we haven't gotten into too many abbreviations yet, and thank you for that. Uh, but we are going now going to touch upon that. Uh, Consul General Duke, you were the ambassador to the ASEAN countries. ASEAN is the Association for Southeastern Asia Nations, or you know, Malaysia, Cambodia, all of those countries between Myanmar all the way to the South China Sea. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> okay. But there is uh, the CPTPP, which used to be the TPP or something. Uh, there is the RCEP, okay, uh, where uh, I think the Japan and Australia are members, but India is not. So if we are not naming a certain country, we'll get to that later, okay? But there are all of these different orientations. Um, my question really is focused on the democracies, since all four countries are democracies. There are democracies in the ASEAN, okay? If you want to address that, Council General Duke, and then there is an important developed country, South Korea. You know, how do they feel about the Quad? There is uh, the country that is responsible for 90% of all the semiconductors made in the world, which inhabit everything we do, Taiwan. You know, these are vibrant democracies. And the Quad is getting together, but these, they are not in it. So, Jane, would you talk about uh, the ASEAN very briefly as to, if I were Malaysian, how would I feel about the Quad? <laughs> well, um we have many different partnerships. I mean, that's how we work as a country. And uh, we see the Quad as very complementary to our relationship with ASEAN. Um, and in fact, President Jokowi of Indonesia has also said that he sees the Quad as partners, not competitors. And we are all, every member of the Quad, um, has deep and long-standing relations with ASEAN. Um, in fact, next year will mark Australia's 50th anniversary of formal diplomatic relationship with ASEAN. And our Prime Minister is in um, Indonesia right now uh, for ASEAN meetings uh, with leaders. And, uh, and he announced a uh, Southeast Asia economic strategy to 2040, very significant um, a piece of work about our commitment to the region. We have extensive development cooperation programs where a member of the RCEP, which is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, is an ASEAN-centred free trade agreement um, that Japan and Korea are in and China uh, and other ASEAN partners. So it's a, we're, we're deeply integrated, we're deeply respectful of ASEAN and every single uh, document that comes out of the Quad, the leader's statements, the vision statement, again reiterates that respect for ASEAN being at the centre of the region. We continue to see that. It's had 
you know, it's over its whole history developed these habits of consultation and cooperation that has avoided war ever since the Second World War. So you've got to respect what they can do. Uh, and uh, having spent at least eight years of my career working in ASEAN, um, I've also seen a real uptick in our relationships bilaterally with every single country of uh, Southeast Asia. So, um, so I, I think we've got to keep that um, work going and keep that messaging going for our friends in Southeast Asia, but they're central partners, partners to our vision for the region. And, being, and what the Quad has committed to do is, which is work with them and work with their priorities. So, um, you know, since we are here in Southern California, we got to talk about Hollywood for a bit, right? So in the 1950s, a famous uh, Jewish comedian, I think it was Groucho Marx, correct me if I'm wrong, said, you know, I don't want to join a club that I can be a member of, you know? He said it more, more uh, poetically, I think. But the point was, as a Jewish person, there were many clubs that they could not join, such as the Jonathan Club and others that I won't name. Um, and he wanted in into those. Okay. So I'm just wondering whether, with all of these different configurations, whether some people are feeling left out, whether that's the intent or not. Um, Secretary Dawson, would you like to add a word or two on that subject? Sure. Um, I do, though, want to, because there were a, a couple of questions raised by the audience that we didn't address sure, just sure. Very briefly on the question. The first question about does it matter or will things change as leaders of the Quad countries change? And I can say we, we have seen um, leaders change in recent months, and there has been no dip or change at all in the commitment to the Quad. I mean, Australia had the experience of having their prime minister uh, on a plane, I think, two days after <laughs> his election yeah. to the Quad Leaders Summit mm -hmm. in Japan. So that's just an example um, of the fact that, no, I don't think there is any risk of that happening. As to the question of how we are bringing um, people the, you know, the regular people, the non-diplomats into the work of the Quad. We are doing a lot of that. There are a number of uh, recent initiatives, I'll, I'll mention just, you know, a, a few briefly, um, but we have something, for example, called um, the Quad Fellows Program, which is um, bringing masters and PhD level students from the Quad countries to the United States for graduate level studies so that they can then go back out into the region and share their expertise across the region. We've just announced a Quad Infrastructure Fellows Program, which will um, train 1,800 people from around the region, non-diplomats, these are you know just average people, um, to enable them to develop the skills to create quality infrastructure. Uh, we've created a quad uh, investors network that will bring in private sector individuals um, to find better mechanisms to bring our combined resources together in the private sector. Um, and so there, those are just a few of the ways. Um, and then on the last question about um, the, the quad is a, a club per se, and are there others um, that are looking at it in that way. The Quad was not created um, as an exclusive club. The Quad was created as for like-minded democracies who have a shared vision uh, and who are seeking to understand what is most needed in the region that we can collectively provide. Um, there has not been uh, any kind of decision made as to what opportunities will be in the future for collaboration with others beyond the four quad partners. But we are certainly looking um, at ways in which we can work together with others. Um, and uh, the Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness is a great example of that, where we are already working with a number of countries across the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Reddy, yeah, uh, yeah, let me add to what Camilla just mentioned. 
as she rightly pointed out that quad is not only for the four countries but is for all the countries in the region one important thing is uh, now we have a 14 member grouping which is called the indo pacific economic forum for prosperity which is also a quad kind of outcome it was decided i think if i am not wrong in the tokyo summit meeting and we have seven asean members in it we have korea we have uh, uh, new zealand and also fiji so we have now 14 countries but this is open for other members in the indo pacific also to join at a future date so oh, there are four pillars of cooperation one is trade uh, second is uh, supply chain third one is cooperation on the clean economy transition and fourth one is what we call fair economy which is a cooperation on anti bribery corruption and also financial irregularities so uh, one one of the pillar supply chain has already been concluded at the detroit ministerial held in may so we are we, we are expecting to conclude uh, fair uh, fair economy and also the clean economy transition pillar in the final round of negotiations which will be held in san francisco late in november uh, this year so not only uh, the quad but whatever our discussion in the quad most of the elements also figure in the discussion in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is a larger grouping. It is open to other countries. Already we have a request from other countries in the region to become members in this 14-member grouping. So that is how I can say a Quad is also like involving other countries, interested countries. So the Quad is a different, like uh, already it has been explained that like-minded democracies. But we are also giving opportunities for other countries in the region to part partnership in this kind of forum, IPEF. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and my conversations to prepare for this, uh, Consul General Sony had also mentioned the Quad Fellows Program. It seems to me it's like the Fulbright scholarships have been yeah. for 50 plus years, and that has led to tremendous cooperation between the countries where the Fulbright uh, has, uh, has brought people together. I'm sure many of you know about the Fulbright scholarships that have existed for what 50 plus years. Um, so, Consul General Reddy, I'm going to put you on the spot for a little bit. You were here in Los Angeles a year ago when you were deputed at that time to the Ministry of Commerce for the Indo-Pacific Economic Forum, I think, right? And all the countries agreed to all the pillars. You were responsible for the trade portion of the India discussion. And all the press afterwards said India did not agree to the trade pillar. So tell us the secret of why that didn't happen. I'm putting people on the spot now. Uh, thank you for this uh, tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would only echo whatever my minister, P.H. Goyal, has stated uh, <laughs> uh, evidently after the ministerial meeting. So basically, uh, we have these four pillars, as I mentioned. Uh, trade pillar is one of them. But it was optional to the member countries to choose their pillars based on their internal stakeholder consultations. So because uh, these, these agreements are not like a proper free trade agreement, like you have mentioned regarding RCEP, RCP, TPP. So because there is no exchange of tariff concessions among the partner countries. So this is a first kind of uh, some agreement which is being try, tried out in a cooperative framework without any commitments uh, of exchange of uh, lowering of the tariffs. So uh, we feel that uh, still the uh, some of the chapters in the trade pillar like uh, for example environment, labor, digital trade and government procurement, these are still in the evolution stage and still uh, countries are coming up with ideas and still uh, means country like India, we are not sure what are the tangible benefits which will accrue to a partner country. But we are there as an observer, we are discussing with all the uh, other 13 uh, member countries uh, constructively and as and when we see there is some tangible elements which uh, Indian stakeholders can benefit, especially in consultation with uh, uh, our industry and also uh, uh, and the people we will be uh, it will take a decision regarding that thank you Th thank you for being so forthright you know i asked that question of your your minister piyush goyal in a public forum there was a tv channel present he said turn that off and then i will answer <laughs> so thank thank you for going on the record for saying that um, so um, 
We've all been thinking about the elephant in the room. Not the elephant, really, the panda in the room, OK? So when we say free and open Indo-Pacific, um, we we'll talk about the rules of international trade. We talk about respecting international borders. I look around Asia and the Pacific region. I will discount North Korea, because they don't really matter, you know. Um, I wonder which country we are talking about. Uh, Secretary Dawson, you spent 10 years in China. Uh, maybe you have in some insight on that before I go to the others. Well, I can. I, I mentioned um, that the U.S. has an Indo-Pacific strategy. We also have a China strategy, and I point that out because there's often some confusion that the Indo-Pacific strategy or the Quad or any of the other multilateral or minilateral groupings that the United States is participating in are about China. Um, and, and what I say to that is that our strategy and our vision for the region is about what we are for. It is not about what we are against. And that's important to make that distinction. We do have a China strategy, which Secretary Blinken has laid out quite clearly. Um, you know, it, you can break it down in three easy words, um, invest, align, and compete. That's investing in our strength at home, aligning with partners and allies, and competing when necessary with China, but ensuring that we are managing that competition in a responsible way so that competition does not veer into conflict. Uh, and also ensuring that we are looking at the areas of necessary cooperation uh, in, in those areas where cooperation uh, is essential for the global good, climate, for example. Thank you, thank you very much, yeah. So here in Southern California, we do recognize that the largest trade partner shipping stuff through the ports is indeed China. We, we get to buy things very affordably from Walmart or Amazon because of what happens in China. And, you know, while we see a lot of uh, rhetoric about, uh, you know, from political uh, elected officials about China. I think all of us recognize that China ain't going away anytime soon. As my friend Bill said, uh, the, you know, the idea really is to have, I guess, a sensible relationship or a balanced relationship with China. And uh, I think Southern California is deeply affected by that. So uh, there's a lot of questions about China here in my stack. Some of them are fairly incendiary which I know you folks will not want to address, but is there anybody else who wants to comment specifically on China and the Quad? Uh, well, let me say this. If you look at the Global Times, you know, they have a lot to say about the Quad and none of it is positive. If you look at the South China Morning Post, which used to be very balanced in the past, they have nothing positive to say about the Quad. So, one thing is going on, right? Anybody else want to address it? Sir? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I cannot tell how the, 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 the Chinese people have been thinking about our yeah. activities. But the, what we've been trying to reach out Chinese is that, the, especially for Japan, what our policies to create the, uh, the uh, constructive and stable relation with China is uh, the key message that we always are sending. And we, in general, have the agreement with Chinese on the, toward that uh, directions. And uh, we are always encouraging China to play, well, it's already the big country, and a uh, role of responsibilities in the global issue, so that we are always encouraging China to be a responsible partner for the global issues, uh, following the international rules. Uh, sometimes maybe it is challenging that the, the action, what they have been doing is not really uh, following the rules that we have been believing. Like currently, we have been suffering the Chinese in suspending the import of the Japanese aqua, uh, aquatic products import because of the uh, uh, Japan is discharging the water treated by the uh, advanced liquid uh, processing system, uh, which uh, scientifically 
uh, uh, proven that it's really uh, good enough to, to allow us to uh, discharge. But they have that Chinese action is different. But we are always pushing and uh, trying to explain and things and. Uh, so I, I think this is the importance is the communication and the dialogue with the, uh, the Chinese. Uh, uh, not, not much kind of accommodating that the changing our policies or rules, but uh, we have been really been explaining that what is eventually beneficial for the Chinese people as well. I think I hope that the most of the Chinese people are getting to understand, but I don't know how, how it goes. But uh. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm just... You know, several people who ask questions, I just want to check with them whether their question has been answered. Uh, Elisa, you, did your question get answered? Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. And then Thomas, did your question get answered? Okay, I'm gonna give you the mic to ask exactly what you meant by that. Okay, one minute or less. First of all, thank you for the CGs to attend tonight and our U.S. state representative. Uh, my question was about quad adjacent or quad plus. So I would like you to discuss the specific countries, for example, the Republic of Korea. You want them to discuss Korea? Yeah. For example. If you discuss that, can it be Korea? Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to speak happened to at that. Camp David recently, right? <laughs> so maybe you can. Uh, I'm happy to speak to that. There is no country that I am aware of that has made a request to, you know, become a formal member of Quad. We have had conversations with countries, in particular the Republic of Korea, about the potential for for um, cooperating on specific lines of effort within the Quad, um, and something that may not be familiar to many of you is that the Quad has uh, a number of working groups um, that range from everything from, um, uh, you know, climate change to space to uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, maritime security, etc. cetera. Um, Korea has indicated they, do, they are interested in cooperating on some of these lines of effort. Um, and that's where I think the conversation is right now, identifying um, which specific lines of effort other countries might be interested in participating in, um, but doing that in a way that makes sense by sort of really doing a stock taking of what are the most critical needs in the region as defined by the region itself and who can bring the resources of expertise to bear in order to address those issues. So those are the kind of conversations that we're having right now. Thank you, thank you. Bob Moore, where are you? Yeah. Uh, did your question get answered? Actually, this would be for Secretary Dawson. Uh, my question had to do with uh, RCEP and, and the Successor to the Trans Pacific Partnership, which the U.S. was a leader in forming and then never joined, uh, China leading the RCP. These are trade organizations, and the U.S. seems to have adopted more of a bilateral approach to trade. Um, my personal view was I wish we were in the TPP and stayed in it, but my question for you is how is that working? Uh, with respect to the participation by both Japan and Australia in both of these other organizations, but the U.S. is not a participant. Are we not at a disadvantage in that regard? And I'd like to hear their reaction as to whether they believe the U.S. should be a part of it. Um, I, I'll, I'll certainly ask Australia and Japanese, Australian and Japanese colleagues to speak to that. I'll just quickly say, I think actually Consul General Reddy spoke um, quite eloquently about what the U.S. is doing in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Uh, and that is, that is um, something that we feel is an incredibly important development for the region. Um, the trade part of that agreement is still 
in negotiation and discussion, but we have 14 countries uh, that are participating in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Um, we have other organizations in which we participate as well, APEC, um, and San Francisco will be hosting the APEC Leaders uh, Summit in November this year. Um, so there are a lot of fora in which the United States is still participating, but I'll turn to, <laughs> turn to Carly. <laughs> well, um, Australia is very much pro-free trade. We've actually, we might be the only country in the Quad that has a free bilateral free trade agreement with each partner. Uh, and we're in the CPTPP and the RCEP, and we've got multiple network of bilateral free trade agreements as well in the region. We're also deeply committed and supportive of um, the um, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, and we're um, pleased that there's been some really good progress to date under uh, supply chains. Um, and we're committed to um, making that as much as success uh, as possible as complementary to all the other frameworks that we have for promoting free trade. Of course, one day we'd love to see the US come back to CPTPP, um, but if this is what we have on the table at the moment, we're deeply committed to it and we see that it's very beneficial for the region. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, just, I just would like to echo Jane that Japan is also is the same page. And the person I've been the per person who have been involved in, uh, in in Washington 2011, Japan joined in the TPP negotiations, and uh, I was so hard working on that process. And uh, I hope it's always up to the, uh, the uh, not the not only the government decision, it the country decision whether you join those uh, trade agreement. So if you really you're pushing the government. To, to come back to the TPP, that will be the uh, beneficial. And the, I think the uh, Southern California may be the right place to promote uh, those uh, ideas and free trade and more uh, collaborations in the economic field. Thank you, thank you. A number of questions that relate to the China-India border, and I'm going to put that aside for now because it could take us until midnight to discuss <laughs> that. And the Consul General Reddy is an expert on trade more than what's happening at the border. I will say uh, that prior to the G20, India spent a tremendous amount of time in negotiating with China to keep things calm during the G20, okay? Uh, because they were seriously concerned that the People's Liberation Army might uh, uh, you know, have some troop movement on the border, as they did when President Xi visited India for the first time. He was on Bang in Bangalore, and I think he was surprised to learn what was happening on the border. But we won't get into that in the public forum. If you have questions for Dr. Reddy offline, you can do that. It doesn't really concern the Quad so much. Um, I have a question from a physician friend, and I can't read your writing. <laughs> Okay. So, if you want to, if your question hasn't been answered, Rohit, can you just spell it out in one sentence? Sure. Uh, it's my, dad, my dad brought back uh, six years ago my kindergarten report that said bad handwriting, but so I, I've, I've kept to that. Uh, my question is, uh, we've talked about pillars of infrastructure. I think healthcare after the pandemic really made us think about what infrastructure means. Are there things that the Quad is trying to do for healthcare preparedness, public health, uh, that we can be part of? In Southern California. I, I can mention a, a couple of things. Um, so there are two sort of works, I mean, multiple work streams that are related to that, but um, there is a, a, a health health security working group of the Quad, which is looking at all elements of, of public health in the region to include pandemic preparedness, response, um, what we can do to ensure that there are, um, that we are better prepared in the future. Um, so certainly there are, are ways 
there. Um, they're also, as I mentioned through the um, earlier through the infrastructure fellows program, that infrastructure includes, you know, not just the hard infrastructure, but in many cases, soft infrastructure as well. Um, and that program is designed, it will be, I think, a continually evolving program, but the idea is to train people from around the Indo-Pacific region in the skills that will enable them to, you know, take the infrastructure back to their own country. Um, so that is certainly one area. And then the last that I would mention, and I'm sure there are plenty of other, actually there are multiple others, including in our critical and emerging technologies work stream. Um, but one more is in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, um, because certainly in the wake of disasters, we often see health catastrophes arise from poor conditions, et cetera. Um, so there's a whole, a whole world, really, of opportunities there. Um, and I think understanding how we can tie that specifically to Southern California is kind of the next step. Um, but we are looking to do, to implement practical programs and bring specific resources to bear with all of these initiatives. So we welcome brilliant ideas that you or any others in the room might have about how we can tie your resources, skills, um, and ideas into what the Quad is doing. Yeah. And I think a lot of the work that David Abel and his organization are doing relate to developing infrastructure of the future with uh, hydrogen and environmentally friendly programs, a lot of which are originating here in Southern California, which is also, by the way, the center of the global electric vehicle industry. Um, Paul Sterngold, did your question get answered with everything we've covered? I apologize, I stepped out of the room, unfortunately. So it was answered before, Paul, before you stepped out. <laughs> so my question uh, was directed to uh, the uh, India. Um, how does your participation in BRICS complicate things with the Quad? <laughs> Uh, I, I have not dealt either bricks or quad. Okay, mm -hmm. so I was only a trade negotiator before I came to <laughs> <laughs> California. But uh, because of the request of Gunjan, I'm participating in the event. But uh, uh, I, I, maybe somebody wants to answer that. <laughs> 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 Thank, thank you, Council General. So, um, um, I, I have a question from Ravi Tilak, I think. Uh, you didn't write it down, so I'll give you the uh, mic. Okay, yeah, all right. Thank you. My question is not about energy or uh, currency or fossil fuels, or hydrogen or economy, trade. My question pertains to much more fundamental human value. And the question is, what is Quad doing? Or does Quad have a forum to address human trafficking? Because human trafficking is happening significantly in the corridors where Quad is very active. So I'd really like to hear from whoever wants to speak on this. I, uh, well, actually, there is one. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Jane, but I did think of one area that we're doing something about that in. Well, I, I was just going to say um, that I am familiar with a particular program um, in my former job as ambassador to ASEAN where we work very deeply and closely with the region to combat human trafficking. Uh, it's a long-standing program. It was about developing the skill sets of um, police um, officials and um, uh, victims, advocates and judges to know how to deal with these kinds of cases. Uh, and uh, it was a program that had experts engaging um, with the individual police forces in each one of the ASEAN countries and then also just generating um, some cross-border cooperation 
um, to build out and, and did get a lot of success. And that's that's been a program that Australia has been deeply connected to in our immediate region. Um, so that was one thing that I had personal familiarity with and uh, has led to some successes. Plus, we do have an ambassador for um, uh, anti-people smuggling and human trafficking who engages very deeply in the UN uh, and, uh, and bilaterally and multilaterally on these issues. We've got federal legislation against it. You're right, it's a, a terrible and unfortunately um, very persistent crime type. Uh, that we have been working to address as well as bring in as well some um, uh, company level requirements for certification that can also make a difference. Uh, so I'll, I'll just mention a couple of, of things. Um, um, in our maritime security work of the Quad, um, an element of that is, um, as was mentioned earlier, through a program called the Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness. This starts to get quite te technical, but essentially what it is is providing um, satellite data to enable ships to see what's in the waters around them. Um, and that can be used to counter illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing, but also all kinds of trafficking. Um, and so that is one of the areas that we're currently focused on. That's the identifying the problem. The next step is the, the sort of law enforcement response to it. Um, and that, that part is still in development, honestly. Um, also, Consul General Reddy mentioned humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, um, the work stream on that. There is also certainly an element tied to countering human trafficking um, following the uh, disaster. Um, and then the, the last part of it, I would say, is that, again, the Quad is really about, um, you know, one of our key concepts is talking to governments and people in the region and understanding what their needs really are. Um, and we hear frequently in the region that there is a need for um, putting in place all the things that keep an economy uh, strong so that people in a given country don't feel the need to leave their country to go elsewhere seeking uh, you know, economic opportunities. So a number of the economic work streams under the Quad, and about two thirds of the working group, um, the working groups under the Quad are focused on economic issues, are about that, you know, building up the economic resilience in a given country or a given region so that people don't have to um, you know, seek opportunities elsewhere and become victim to human trafficking. Thank you, thank you. Um, so there's one topic uh, uh, that is not directly related to the quad, but I do want to bring it up. Uh, our friends in the table back there contacted me at 9 p.m. yesterday and wanted to attend uh, the Armenian community. And I think President Biden was the first president to, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, Camille, to recognize the Armenian genocide uh, 100 years ago. Um, if you folks have a simple question about how your concerns, you have two questions here, how it connects to the Quad, can one of you stand up and just speak loudly from there? Just identify yourself and
Does anybody feel qualified to answer that question here? Yeah. Um, I appreciate you bringing it up and we can discuss it offline and thank you all for being here. Um, we had, uh, the Armenian community has done tremendous work in Southern California and you know we have had a governor from the Armenian community, uh, Governor George Duke Majin. So we are all very grateful for your, your, for your community's contribution to the success of Southern California in particular. Um, so there are some questions that I don't really understand. Somebody is asking about Oppenheimer, and uh, I will answer that question for you. You can't call America responsible for the movie. And the director was British, so we'll take that offline. Christine, did your question get answered? It did, okay. All righty. Um, is there anybody else who wants to ask one final question before our diplomats get to have their cheesecake, which they missed? Okay. <laughs> Okay, Ellie, you, if you can stand up and talk loudly, the wireless mic isn't working anymore. <laughs> Ran out of steam, but we didn't. Right, uh, so my question is pretty great. So for a diplomatic level policy, everything is going on uh, with respect to realignment of the supply chain, all the issues in the region. Now, what is the general public perception in each of your countries with respect to policy, because policy will not stand in the long run if you don't have policy. So you're talking about supply chain resilience? No, not, not necessarily. All the policy that we're making in the Asia Pacific right now, in Japan, in India, uh, the State Department, Australia, all together. So what is the Australian public, Japanese public, and Indian public perception to support these policies? So we are, we are, I'm being told to wrap up the program quickly so I'll let any one of any one of you to choose to what to say to Ali and then we'll be we'll turn into informal networking after that and you can enjoy your cheesecake before you do that. I'll just jump in quickly. Um, the Australian approach to the Indo-Pacific has got strong bipartisan support. Um, as uh, Camille just mentioned before it was two days after the Australian Prime Minister ch turned over uh, and was elected and he was on a plane to go to a meeting for the Quad. Um, and, uh, and the bipartisan policy, uh, policy support is because of strong public support for engagement in our region. Um, so quick answer from me, very strong public support. On the US side, I don't think I have to explain to any of you in the room that um, there aren't a whole lot of issues in the United States right now which enjoy bipartisan support, but actually uh, support for um, U.S. commitment to presence in engagement with the Indo-Pacific is an issue that absolutely enjoys bipartisan support. We hear that from the Hill on a daily basis. I mean, of course, there are some you know, disagreements about specific individual policies or individual approaches, but as a, a broad issue, there's very strong support. Um, and that, you know, that just reflects the reality that the Indo-Pacific region is so critically important to our own prosperity and security. No, just to add, uh, as I was part of the Indian negotiating team at the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, so before each round, uh, there is a stakeholder consultation, which is open to all the uh, stakeholders, especially industry and the non-government organizations to participate and give their views. And also, there's a feedback mechanism. Uh, after each round, there's also press release informing the public about what is happening. So overall, I think especially uh, with regarding to the uh, negotiations at the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, I think most of the public in all the countries are well informed. Thank you. Well, uh, I think this, this uh, like especially the free and open Indo-Pacific is the idea that Japan is promoting. And then Japan is also the, uh, the, the advocate of this uh, Quad uh, group. And uh, I think 
uh, there is nobody. I never heard anybody who's been against this, uh, you know, Japanese initiative and this, well, working together with uh, Indo-Pacific countries and promoting uh, collaboration with these countries for the prosperity and the growth of this region. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we are, we've gone over our allotted time, but hey, brown people do that all the time, you know. So. Did everybody have a good time? Was it worth, worth spending a time here? Okay, terrific. Um, later on, if there's anything that went wrong, you can blame me, please, okay? Uh, I take responsibility for everything that went wrong. Um, at the, uh, I think uh, Smita has a plan for the next steps here. Thank you all. Thank you. So just like there's a Superman and Beetle Man, there's a Blame Man. So an applause for our wonderful Consul General and the Deputy Secretary of Commerce and for our wonderful moderator, Gunjin. Thank you. So I would also like to call, um, um, recognize that we have amongst us the Chairman of the Board of World Affairs, Council of Orange County, Mr. Bill Edwards. and Dr. Richard Downey, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Orange County. And I would like to call him here to be able to say a few words. And oh, thank you so much, Smita. Uh, what a wonderful night, and I thank all of our speakers for a terrific discussion. Very, very interesting. You know, it's, it's, um, it's the reason we all get together uh, for events like this is to understand what's going around in our world much better. But what you've done tonight is help us not only understand that, but you've helped us understand how what you're, is going on in the quad around the world affects us here in Orange County and in California. So thank you very much for just a wonderful discussion. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, I, I also want to say thanks. What I'm, what I'm here to do is really give a couple of uh, some, some thank you gifts to our speakers. But before I do that, I want to say thanks to all the folks that, that made this happen. And first off, I want to say Smita. Uh, what a wonderful job as MC tonight, They're just mar marvelous job. You know, uh, and, and since, um, uh, she, actually Smita mentioned uh, that Lord Kristen's birthday is today, she said she would only mention that if I danced. And I, I swear Lord Krishna would really appreciate the fact that I did not dance. But since I did not dance, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug your Four, four Samosas move, movie. So uh, all of you that I, I recommend Four Samosas to, uh, uh, for, on your, your uh, favorite streaming platform. Uh, I also want to say what a wonderful job, Gunjan, that you did tonight. I have, uh, you, you, you truly made this interesting in all ways for all those that are here. And I have, have, I have to uh, say I, how much I admire the fact that, uh, that you were able to put Groucho Marx, the Jonathan Club, and the Quad, not only in one sentence, but in one question. It was very impressive. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, you, you, you said you take the blame for everything happened tonight. You also deserve uh, the, the, uh, the blame for all the good things that happened tonight. Would you please join me in a big round of applause for a wonderful job for Gunjan as moderator tonight. Um, and last of all, I want to thank all of you. Uh, well, not last of all, because I want to give gifts. I'm going to ask Ronick Desai to help me, uh, here he is, to help, help do that. But uh, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight and for being so engaging in all of your questions and all, just making it a fun night. And uh, I, I want to say, you know, the, on behalf of the World Affairs Council of Orange County, uh, we would love to see those of you that didn't raise your hand earlier that said, yes, I'm a member of the World Affairs Council of Orange County. Uh, we, we do uh, some great events on, on your tables in front of you. See that little placard? Uh, on the back of it is our upcoming events and our next upcoming event, which uh, those of you that will find it convenient find, might, might find it istra, interesting. We're doing event on the 20th of September at Cal State University Fullerton on the, the threats of uh, fentanyl with uh, Secretary, State Secretary, uh, Senator uh, Tom Umberg, uh, former uh, judge, 
Jim Gray, who is the former vice presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party. But it's what, what are we going to do about fentanyl? So those of you who are interested, I would encourage you to attend that. I also would highlight one other, other event, uh, which is the, our gala on the 16th of December, which is with uh, former National Security Advisor, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. So I would encourage uh, all of you who are interested to attend that. It's a gala. Uh, we're going to ask in a little bit our, uh, some of our council generals to, uh, to also come. We're going we're to miss you, Jane. We're, though you'll, be, you'll be, still be here, won't you, before you uh, – it's Jane is leaving, unfortunately, for Canberra in December. So uh, you'll, 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 when, when in December are you leaving? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Hopefully – well, I, I'm, I'm hoping that there's still time. But um, – but I, I really want to thank all of our, our wonderful speakers tonight. We would like to give you uh, a couple of things. And, Ronick, I'm going to ask you to help, help here with just a, just a small token. But we, what, this is a small token, but we also have what is, um, is far more important is uh, we would like to make all of you a, an honorary ambassador-level member of the World Affairs Council of Orange County. So we'll, we'll give you each of you those tonight. So if, Ron, if you will help me tonight, we'll do that. Oh, they, they've cut me off. They cut, no, they didn't. No, they didn't. Um, they've, I, I'd just like to say one last time uh, to all of our, our wonderful speakers tonight, will you please join me in a wonderful round of applause, a thunderous round of applause for all of our speakers tonight. Wonderful job. Thank you so much.